To this now, an interesting focus on Workers' Day. A lot has been said about the fourth industrial revolution and how its technologies are already changing the way we work and live. Is South Africa's workforce equipped to deal with uh, this changing landscape? And what should we be teaching our children to prepare them for digitization? For more on this, I'm joined now by Dr. Miriam Altman, who is a professor in 4IR at the School of Economics at the University of Johannesburg. I've got to tell you, uh, Dr. Altman, <laughs> a few years ago when China uh, CGTN uh, introduced a... a, a, a an, an AI news anchor, uh, I was shaking, I was quivering in my boots, <laughs> thinking my job is in trouble. But on a serious note, uh, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence, robotics, the fourth industrial revolution. Please locate, uh, locate us as South Africa. How far are we in embracing these technologies? And importantly, what's, what's the correlation between where we are on that trajectory with the labor landscape? Yeah. So the first thing I should say is you maybe you should be worried <laughs> because actually uh, your job might be well replaceable. Oh, um, no, that's not what I want to hear, Dr. Altman. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about it, but actually now that you mention it, most of those functions, uh, even, even the um, interview questions could be uh, replaced with, uh, a robot. Oh my goodness! All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> on that note, then let me move you. Let me move you along. Let me move you along. Yeah. So, um, you know, and and the choice is made just to make that point. So, so many functions can be replaced, actually, but the choice is actually made on the economics of you know the preparedness and economics of it. So. Uh, you, you know, it's not just that you change technology for the hell of it. It, it may be that the, it related to cost, related to efficiency. There's, there's lots of reasons why, um, why that technology may change. And it's not simply because it's available, J just to make the point. If I, if I can just put your heart a little bit at ease. So now when we think about uh, 4IR, let me, let me put it in the simplest possible way because it gets, it gets overcomplicated, I think. The first is uh, what's called Internet of Things, and that means uh, um, how smart devices interconnect. Um, the second, you know, like um, uh, sensors and machines, robot, robotics, uh, and that kind of thing. The second uh, area is the systems that, uh, that exchange data, uh, and that would be like cloud, big data, artificial intelligence. It's the thing that translates the data. So that's really what 4IR encompasses, and then a whole culture of change in, in that regard. Now, in South Africa, we are probably furthest ahead in Africa and, and pretty far ahead and, and capable. Um, you know, over COVID, there, there was dramatic change in relation to areas like financial transactions, uh, in transport, in e-commerce, uh, medical diagnosis, uh, utility vending. There's a whole lot of areas that leapt forward as well um, over the, over the uh, period of COVID and increasing movement to the cloud. The challenge in South Africa is not so much the technological capability, but rather in a quality and access to you know, broadband uh, and a digital world that uh, means that um, it's very hard to bring the, the whole population along. And if we want to succeed as a country, then we have to have the whole population engaged mm. with all things digital. Sure. So just, let, just tell me then, in terms of the sectors where we are seeing some application of AI, robotics, the Internet yeah. of Things in South Africa, other than yourselves um, and, and, and Professor Marwala at uh, UJ, uh, as well as Professor Tawana Kupe, um, who seemed to, at least to my mind, to be uh, the spearheading this conversation uh, about digitization for IR, robotics, uh, and artificial intelligence. Other than that, are we seeing um, application of these, uh, these concepts in South Africa with the result that, you know, for instance, in areas where self-driving vehicles are now something that's common, I don't know if there are places like that, uh, but certainly that would have implications for workers who used to drive uh, these vehicles. Well, I don't know that self-driving vehicles are common anywhere. So, 
you know, let's just create a reality base. The way that um, this it gets, it's applied in every day in our lives. When you're, when you get online to shop, when you um, get a lot online to get information, uh, we're actually using these kinds of services all the time. And information is being gathered about us all the time, which is sometimes a danger, um, and being used to uh, get advertising to us and other products. Um, we're, we're engaging with it all the time, whether we know it or not. I think most people are aware of it. Anybody who's got a cell phone and is engaging online via their mobile phone, certainly, um, whether you're aware of it or not, is being monitored, is providing information, is accessing information, you know, et cetera. Mm. I remember a time when, I think it was in 2020, when one of the big banks, Standard Bank, was closing a number of their branches uh, simply based on the fact that they were saying that demand uh, yeah. for in-branch services is no longer what it used to be. There are still people who still go into a branch, but certainly uh, the numbers are not what they used to be. When, when one think about, thinks about examples like those, is one justified to have a reaction of fear, concern, or... Could we look at the situation around and say, actually, it presents opportunity as well? What opportunities does it present? I think we have to see it as an opportunity. Certainly, I'm very happy not to go to a branch. <laughs> so, you know, transacting online in a country where uh, there are great distances, it's not an issue for me, but for most people, uh, getting to a bank is a very expensive endeavor. And um, certainly the expansion of digital banks is a fantastic thing, particularly from an equity perspective. So, you know, you win some and you lose some. You may lose some teller jobs. You gain on another side. People save money in terms of their transport. There are a lot of benefits. Where one may uh, put the brakes on is in areas like uh, retail checkout. But let's, let's take that as an example, where if you were in North America or the UK, you would find... Uh, quite a lot of self-serve in checkout. They often have mixed kinds of checkouts, some with, some with cashiers and some uh, where you can just do it digitally and, and, and self-serve. Now, the question that sometimes arises in a country like South Africa with very high unemployment is whether you put the brakes on stuff like that where you're not really affecting national productivity by virtue of stopping it so you wouldn't want to stop uh, necessarily automation and manufacturing or even in agriculture, but in certain kinds of services that don't really interface in the globe, in global market. So it doesn't, it doesn't really dramatically affect national productivity. Um, then one may want to put the brakes on yeah. um, to, to stop that. Now, if I can just give an example, uh, a longstanding regulation. I've, I've been involved over the years in trying to make sure that it stays in place, which is petrol stations. Now, internationally, like in the, if you were in the United States, for example, or Canada, I'm not sure where else, um, you, you would be mostly serving yourself petrol. And in South Africa, uh, actually, the regulations don't allow self-service. It is not possible to have self-service in South Africa and you are required to have four court service agents. Now, from a job creation perspective in South Africa, again, there isn't really a productivity, a negative productivity impact. So you may as well have, you may as well keep those workers there. Yeah. Lastly, Dr. Altman, the, we've heard about um, AI bias and the, um, you know, the, 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 the anomalies that arise from some of the algorithms and how they play out and manifest, you know, certain biases uh, within, within society itself. And in the United States, this has led to some kind of movement around uh, legislation. Uh, I think they're calling it uh, Algorithmic Accountability Act uh, that is being introduced in Congress. What are the implications of AI bias and um, the anomalies in, in algorithms for a situation like South Africa where perhaps, you know, these technologies could be used perhaps in instances, for instance, around job searches and narrowing down candidate selection and, and suitability and the likes, and also as we get more and more applicability of these technologies in our, in our economy? 
Well, you know, there's there's always a uh, bias in any kind of modeling and any kind of profiling and any kind of recruitment process. So, you know, for employers, for recruitment agencies, et cetera, when you when you look at it that way, um, you know, the, the, the check and balance will come from the quality of recruitment and the logarithms and uh, the use of information will be changed, I would think, in alignment of that. So if, it, if, if people are poorly selected as a result of that, then um, I would think the checks and balances in uh, the competition around recruitment would, uh, would discipline that. The, the problem that arises is, um, I suppose, the kind of thing you know, I guess it's what Elon Musk is raising around uh, Twitter, as an example, is how information is fed to people. So, you know, some people choose not to use Google as a search engine and prefer to use uh, search engines that don't uh, analyze uh, your what your previous searches. Because as you know, one of the most dangerous aspects is not even just recruitment. It is uh, a bi affirmation bias. In other words, you get fed information according to your belief system as per your previous searches. That means that that links into um, the problem of fake news, of, um, of not really getting balanced information. So the, the internet effectively, or the search engine, effectively entrenches a, a, a predetermined bias that you may have shown already, and you haven't chosen to have that. That is probably, uh, in the information world, the more dangerous hmm. element within that. And of course, it raises efficiency in searches as well. But it, the, the, inform, the world of information is, is probably the, one of the most important, you know, the way it's filtered, the way it's delivered, um, the way it's vetted is uh, certainly one of the most topical issues globally right now. Yeah. All right. I've got to thank you for your time and your insights there, Dr. Miriam Altman. Uh, good engaging with you on these matters. Hopefully we can keep them in the spotlight as well uh, as we continue in the coming weeks, uh, months and years uh, as the situation evolves.